Hey, everybody. Welcome to the field work. I'm Tara Vanderdusen. And I'm Zach Johnson. Do we have a different script? I think we we may because there was this kind of an awkward pause here last time as well. <laughs> it says you're supposed to say, by the way, somebody, somebody's supposed you. to say, thank the Walton Family Foundation. Oh, OK. I don't have that. Oh, maybe I, I can. Oh, I think the deal is you printed it and I added it in later. Sorry about that. Ah, yes. OK. Zach is killing those trees by printing everything. <laughs> Sound bite that, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we are talking with Alan Williams, a farmer with a PhD. His story is kind of complicated. He grew up on a farm in South Carolina, then went to college for like a really long time. He got a BA and MS and a big old PhD. He worked as a college professor, then he up and quit. So he worked as a college professor and then he, he just up and quit. I imagine that's not very common. I mean, I'm trying to summarize a bit. So how about we uh, welcome Alan Williams onto the show to tell us more about his story? Well, I'll be very happy to share that story with you. Okay, let's jump back here, Alan. My understanding is that you grew up on a farm. Can you get a, give us a little bit of that history where that was and what was happening on your family farm when you grew up? Yep, grew up on my family's farm in South Carolina in the Piedmont region. Uh, so that's the region between the coastal plains of the East Coast and the Blue Ridge Mountains. And my family farm has been there since 1840. So I represented the, the sixth generation on the land there. Uh, and we were, when I was growing up, we were a pretty diverse farm. We had uh, multiple species of livestock. We did beef cattle, some dairy. Uh, we had poultry, we had pigs, sheep, that type of thing. But we also did uh, row cropping, uh, and in, in that day and age, that was consisted of small grains and corn primarily. We also were in a region that was a really good orchard region, and in South Carolina at that point in time was the largest peach producing state in the United States. So we also had some peach orchards, some apples and pears, and things like that, and we did market gardens, and we uh, we called it truck farming at that point, and we also had a general store, so we marketed a lot of what we produced on the farm when I was growing up through our, our general store, so today that will be called direct marketing, but we just called it a general store back then. <laughs> Uh, that is really cool. I love how you said it's like direct marketing. <laughs> uh, you're like, you know, it was just a general store. So one of the things that um, you had shared in one of your, you know, when we were talking with you is that you kind of did cover cropping before cover cropping was actually a thing. Um, was that kind of one of the things that you guys did a little different than maybe everybody else around you? You know, most of the farms around us were at least somewhat similar to us in that they were multi-generational and, and again, more diverse than, than the average farm of today. Uh, it really wasn't until we got deeper into the 70s and into the 80s that most of the agriculture in the region that I grew up became very similar to what we see today, where farms started specializing in you know, either either specific types of livestock production or, or row crop production. So as we work towards you becoming a professor here, yep. I want to kind of get the story as far as what you did after high school and what drove you to, to where you are today. So what, what, what did it look like when you were done with high school? Where did you go from there? Well, in my family, you basically had one option of where you went to college, and that was Clemson University. That was the tradition, and if you did not go there, then – you would be sort of like the black sheep of the family. So, uh, so I went off to Clemson University and majored in animal science. And so I got a got my bachelor's degree in animal science. And I was had every intention of coming back home to the family farm. You know, that was that was absolutely what I was going to do. I'm I'm the oldest son, and so I was going to continue the family tradition. And I got my bachelor's. I did come back home to the family farm. But I had this very persistent major professor that he kept calling me up and wanting me to 
come back to grad school. So it kept offering me and offering me. And I, for more than a year and a half, I consistently turned him down. Then I remember one day he called me up and he said, Alan, he said, uh, I've got a final offer for you here. And if you turn me down this time, I'll, I'll leave you alone. I won't bother you anymore. And I said, okay, I'm listening. And he said, if you'll come back to Clemson to get your master's, we're going to send you down first to a place called the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean. So an island called St. Croix. And you're going to work with a breed of cattle down there called the Cinepole that was developed in the Virgin Islands. And you're going to do your research, collect your data, and then come back at Clemson, do your coursework. And for a country boy from South Carolina that had never been at that point in my life, further away from home than Myrtle Beach or the Blue Ridge Mountain, I thought, boy, this Caribbean sure sounds pretty exotic. <laughs> and uh, and so the young 20-something, uh, I said, hmm, I may have to do that. So, so off I went to the Virgin Islands. So I was down there a year, came back, finished up my master's work, and got talked into going on for a PhD. I did that at Louisiana State University. And at that point, after completing my PhD, uh, I felt obligated going to academia instead of going back home to the family farm. And so that's what I did. And I ended up the next 15 years of my life as a researcher and a professor. So at the end of 15 years, in that academic career, I was a tenured full professor. Yeah. But I started noticing that a lot of what we were doing, a lot of the research that we were doing and things that we were, quote, discovering really weren't moving the needle very much. And, and I kept going back to my background of growing up on the farm and the fact that it was a long term, multi generational farm. My family had bought and paid for land and made a good living. And Yet we were doing research to tell them that everything they were doing was wrong and we needed to make radical changes and get with it, you know, get with the times. Um, and I bought in hook, line, and sinker, to be honest with you. And, uh, and, but yet I started seeing inconsistencies and noticing that in spite of all the advancements we thought we were making scientifically in technology, our soils were not getting better, and they weren't. You know, we were just more and more relying on inputs and that our livestock were not getting healthier. They were becoming more and more reliant on inputs. And even worse, our farm economy was deteriorating. And I decided I had to make some hard choices. Either I stayed in academia for another 10 to 15 years until I could retire and then try to do something different or start right then and there to do something different and much to my wife's chagrin at that point in time and that was in the year 2000 i made the decision to resign and leave the university and leave the security leave tenure leave benefits and monthly guaranteed paycheck and everything else and go back to farming full-time farming and ranching and also some consulting so that's the decision I made in the year 2000, and uh, that's what I've been doing ever since. I, I understand why you came back to farming. You explained that pretty well. But yeah. from a farmer's standpoint, you know, you mentioned how you deeply love the heritage of family farming. So what drove you to academia in the first place when you had the intention of, of going back to the farm right away? I guess the first was that being taught into going to the Caribbean, right? At that point, it seemed like, something exotic adventurous to do so i did it and then once i got back into grad school i sort of got captured and intertwined in you know all of that and okay wow this is look at what we're doing from a science and a technology standpoint and man we're going to change the world and make the world a much better place and we're going to make farmers healthier and wealthier and you know, all of these types of things. And I just fell all into that. I was young and impressionable. So I want to talk a little bit more about kind of your realization that, you know, the things that you were studying and researching, maybe, as you said, weren't moving the needle the way you thought. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what your research was focused on? Tell us a little bit about the university central bull test and just what you were doing there at the university. My formal training in my, you know, graduate degrees, I was a geneticist and reproductive physiologist. So, so that was my formal training. You know, one of the things I did was I was director of the university central bull test. And that created one of my aha moments because we were running a very traditional test. Bulls were on full feed and the winning bull, uh, and, and I'm saying that in quotes, but the winning bull every year was the bull that had the highest average daily gain. But yet, you know, we were, we were having bulls bloat, bulls founder, uh, you know, bulls were getting gobby fat all of that because the whole emphasis of these bull tests at that point in time was how much gain can we get on these darn things in in a relatively short period of time because i was also a reproductive physiologist i was doing all of the fertility exams on these bulls post test and 50 to 60 percent of the bulls would fail the first time around you know they they were way too fat you know, they, they were stressed from being on a hot ration, basically a feedlot style ration. And when producers would buy these bulls out of the bull test sales, you know, they were so fat, they would melt down on them when they put them out on pasture. And I kept thinking, why are we doing this? This, this just makes no sense at all. And so I actually transitioned the bull test to a forage, you know, a grass-based bull test which at that point in time was unheard of. You didn't do that, but we did it. And the bulls were far healthier. We eliminated all the health problems that we had. They actually gained fairly well, and, but more than 90% of them now passed the fertility exam at the end of the test versus only 50 to 60% passing. And the bulls were not fat, they were athletic. And so when they were purchased, by the commercial cow-calf producers, they'd go out on pasture and keep gaining and not melt down on them uh, and be able to breed cows a lot more effectively and efficiently. So that was sort of one of the turning points in my way of thinking. Was this a, a common way? So you're, you're talking to a grain farmer here. Tara's a lot more familiar yep, yep. with what you're talking about than I, than I am. But is this a, similar to how a, a livestock farmer would kind of keep a measure of the health of the herd as well? Well, see, that's the problem. If you're a cow-calf producer, you're going to be highly reliant on grazing, not feeding up. But you, you, you can't afford to feed your cows every day all year long. Uh, you'll go broke doing that. Yeah, And uh, you're reliant on your rangeland or your pasture, what you're growing out there in forages, but yet we were taking these bulls that were going to be purchased by these cow-calf producers and essentially putting them in what amounted to a feedlot, you know, and feeding them up on, a, on rations that were pretty similar to what we would finish cattle on in a feedlot. And, and as I said, get them gobby fat. And, and we, put, we placed the wrong emphasis on what a top bull should be. You know, the top bulls were the high-gaining bulls. Because everybody had the mindset, well, you know, you're producing calves to go to the feedlot, so that's what you want, but not thinking about the economics of what's happening out on the ranch, you know, on the range. And uh, so it was a little bit contradictory, but yet it was the way all the universities did it. So thinking about that, you've mentioned these aha moments a couple of times now. What was the final, like, I guess, straw for you before, like, was there a final moment before you realized, like, there's got to be a better way? Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm leaving university, I'm headed back to the farm. Like, what was that moment like, um, leading up to it? And then maybe just afterwards of you finally, like, deciding it was time to go back to the farm? Yeah, good question. Um, one of the things that was happening, and this is, this was not unique to me, it happens all the time to many, many faculty members at universities um, was that, you know, you would do research. And again, I'm talking about being at a land grant, a pub 
public taxpayer supported university, right? Uh, where everything is supposed to be available for public purview. Uh, so I would do research. You know, and I, we would be funded. We would have obtained, you know, funding from some company, agribusiness company or whatever, to do research. And but yet, if the results weren't what the funder liked, the research often got buried. You were not allowed to publish it. That really was one of the things that made me say, I just can't do this anymore. And ironically, so when I made the decision, I'll share with you what my colleagues in my department had told me. So they asked me, well, what are you, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to farm and I'm going to consult. And comments were, well, you can't make a living farming. And I was thinking to myself, no, wait a minute. We're doing all the research, and we're the ones telling all the farmers and ranchers what they need to be doing. And you're telling me I can't leave the university and make a living farming? I have uh, a lot of thoughts on that. That's pretty interesting. But I want to hear from your perspective then. Did you have the same concerns? Did you did you think you know the same thing, that you were diving in? into this head first and switching from a professor to a farmer, did you have serious concerns about the same things that your colleagues had concerns about? To a certain extent. I mean, you know, number one, you, you're leaving all of that security, right? So, and your livelihood is now solely dependent on you. So yes, I, I had fear. Absolutely, I did. Uh, but I had been born and raised, you know, on my family's farm. I knew farming. I knew ranching. You know, I was like, okay, my family has made it since 1840. Uh, I grew up with that. Why can't I do it? Even though I just spent the last 15 years in academia, why can't I not do this? So I had a level of confidence. Can I say complete confidence? Absolutely not. But did I have a level of confidence? Yes. We are going to take a quick break right now, and we'll be back after just a bit. So I guess going now to the moments after you left, what did you start out with farming? Where were you located? How many acres did you start with? Like, what did you do on those acres? Like, what was the next step for you? Uh, so Mississippi. Uh, a thousand acres, a lot of learning by the seat of my pants, <laughs> a ton of trial and error because I knew that I couldn't make it in what we today call conventional. And I had to do things differently uh, because I could not afford to pay for land and everything else, uh, selling wing calves at a local auction barn and you know, just all of the things that, that you think you should do at that point in time, and you were told were the right things to do. And with heavy outlay of input cost, no, you, you can't buy and pay for a farm with that. So I knew I had to look at things very differently. And so I started looking around at who was out there in North America that was doing things differently and, was, and were being successful at it. And I started making trips and going and visiting a lot of different farms and ranches and spending some time learning what they were doing and gleaning both good and bad, you know, and paying, paying a lot of attention to what they were doing. But because it wasn't a research project funded by somebody else, every penny was coming out of my back pocket. I had to learn real quick or I will be out of business. How did you end up in Mississippi with a thousand acres right off the bat? I'm curious about that. Why, how did you do that? And why did you not end up back in South Carolina on the family farm? Going back home wasn't really a viable option. I left and I had been gone for quite a while. My family obviously had to move on. I value that heritage so much and what my family has done. I wasn't going to go back home and upset the apple cart. Okay. Yeah. I just was not going to do that. I was either going to make it or fail, you know, on my own. 
and so that's that's how I ended up doing it in Mississippi. We we already lived there, and I had developed close ties and friendships, and like I said, I was able to partner with a friend to get started. And so you guys started with crops and cattle then? Yep, yep. How many head of cattle did you have? Like what? What breed were they? What was what was your goal with the cattle? I uh, started with about 140 and built up to about 700. Uh, the breeds were uh, predominantly Black Angus Cross and then transitioned over time into Red Angus Cross. You know, with some Continental, but very little ear. Uh, we tried to stay away from a lot of, you know, Brahmin or Zebu influence and, you know, trying to produce very moderate type cattle that worked well on on grass and relied predominantly on grass rather than a lot of inputs. We wanted to we wanted to reduce all inputs as much as possible you know, in in what we were doing and yet be able to produce, you know, really good net profits per acre. For me it's never been about yield or weaning weight or anything about that. It, it, it is about net profit per acre, not per head if I'm dealing with cattle or whatever, but net profit per acre. That's really the bottom line. So obviously knowing your history of your family farm and knowing like what you studied and some of the, the concerns you saw, why were you choosing to do like low inputs? Were you, were you like organic or is it, there any kind of like certification or what made you just decide to go that route? Um, besides the obvious, like what was your goal with the low inputs? First of all, organic, nope. Any kind of certification, nope, not a one. Primary reason is because the more inputs you put in, the lower your net profit per acre. That's almost 90 plus percent of the time. And, and we've worked in the interim, I've worked with more than 4,500 farmers and ranchers across more than 32 million acres in the U.S. Uh, so I've got a very extensive and deep level of experience working with farmers and ranchers on a consultation basis. And we do analysis all the time. And I can I can just tell you point blank, you, you know, 90 plus percent of the time, the more you increase reliance on input, the lower your actual realized net profit per acre. Uh, that's almost always the way it works out. And, uh, and when you're more and more reliant on external inputs, then you're creating a lot of negative epigenetics in there that you're having to deal with. And you are creating a reliance. You're, I call it crutching up. You know, you're crutching up your livestock. They're nowhere near as resilient anymore. And they don't have near the longevity. And you know, our soils are the same way. I, I want I want my biology and my soils working for me as much as possible. And there's a lot of antagonisms there with high, high levels of inputs. Uh, so I had to decide, am I going to rely on high levels of inputs and, and do it that way? Or am I going to rely a lot more on, uh, you know, my natural systems? and my natural processes and the biology that is available for me. So for you, you find that to be true, whether it comes to cattle or the soil, you, you find that with, with cattle and crops? Well, absolutely. And with cattle, so there, there's no difference. I'm, I'm relying on crops, so to speak, for my cattle, right? Sure. They're eating forages every day. So forages are a crop. They grow in soil, just like corn, beans, wheat, anything else does. Uh, they grow in soil. They're just as dependent on the health of that soil. My forage crops, my pastures are just as dependent on the health of that soil as any row crop I can grow or vegetable crop I can grow. There is no difference. Soil is soil. Microbes are microbes. Plants are plants. Animals are animals. And uh, that's what we've discovered. It, it, and we've worked in more than 40 countries around the world. It's no different no matter where you go. Um, you know, what we have found is that the same, the exact same principles that we apply, apply no matter where you go in the world, no matter what you're growing or producing, and no matter what your soil type or climate is. We use the same principles over and over. It's just 
how do we apply those principles within context of that individual farmer ranch where they're located? That's the only difference. Uh, and that's, that's what I've absolutely discovered. It, so we don't have to change the principles. All we have to do is make sure we're applying those principles within the proper context. And if we do that, you have a very, very high likelihood of being financially successful as a farmer or rancher and building a very healthy, resilient system on your farm or on your ranch. I think that's a point that sometimes gets missed in the conversation with people that aren't deeply involved in it is, you know, you talk about the principles working everywhere, but I think you hit on an important point there when you say we need to apply them within context. I mean, I think that's a that's a great way to look at it because it all of this has to be looked at from a a specific farm standpoint. I mean, I can't imagine that everything exactly the same as what you're doing in Mississippi is going to fit, you know, my corn and soybean farm here in West Central Minnesota. So I think that's a a great way to put that. Or yeah, our dairy and cattle operations out here in eastern New Mexico, West Texas. You know, it's I I think that's always such a good point with sustainability, regenerative ag, whatever word you want to use, is the entire point is working with what land you have and what your ecosystem looks like. That is correct. We've worked in every conceivable environment you can imagine and in every type of agriculture you can imagine. And again, you're, both of you are correct. The principle, the same principles apply, but it must be within the context of the region, the climate, the type of agriculture that you're doing, and your individual farm or ranch. It, 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 it's not even the same relative to your neighbor. You can have a next door neighbor in their context can be quite different than yours. That was literally going to be my next question was, is the area more of a challenge or some of the farmers you're working with yep. more of a challenge? So it's interesting that you touched on that. That's right. It's never the area and it's never the country. It's the same problems. We can be talking to farmers in Australia, in an African country, in Asia, in the UK, Ireland, wherever, they all have the same problems. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They have the same darn problems and they have the same thought processes. So it's always the human dynamics. That is always the most challenging, not the type of agriculture, not the soils, not the climate. That, that's not the real challenge. We can, we can successfully alter all of that. Uh, so that's not the deal. The deal is how do we transform minds? That's where we have to alter the way that we're thinking and what we're doing. Perhaps hypnosis. Have you tried that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, they have to be thinking this way for themselves. Yeah. You know, so it they have to fully understand the principles and how to apply those principles within their and here we go again with this word, their very specific context. That, again, can often be the hardest hurdle to initially get over. Now, that being said, once they get over that hurdle, then you can just see their mind whirling and they begin to have their own aha moments over and over again. And they start to have a whole lot of fun. So I, I think I understand exactly what you're saying here, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in my mind, the way I look at it is that if a farmer, if a farmer is looking at implementing new things and doing something different, he or she, they have to, they have to be committed to wanting it to work. And I, and I know I'm guilty of this myself where, you know, maybe we're going to try a new practice, but I'm not totally on board with it. And so therefore one way or another, for some reason or another, I'm going to find a reason that it's not going to work. And once you get fully committed, I feel like you can make that work. As long as you are committed and you want to see it succeed, I think that's a big key for a lot of farmers when it comes to looking at new practices. It, 
It is. And, but, you know, none of us just inherently understand we're a farmer, right? It, it doesn't work that way. We have to, we have to be fully educated in, you know, what that new practice is and the nuances of it and how it really impacts us within what we're doing, you know, on our own farms and ranches and and how to properly implement it on a step-by-step -step basis. If you make a sudden radical shift, you can have a complete train wreck. Um, so, so you have to understand how do I work in these new practices based on what I've been doing so that I don't upset the apple cart financially and, you know, from a productivity standpoint as well. So that's where a lot of education and training comes in. Um, that That's why, you know, like incentive programs for farmers to just plant a cover crop. We'll pay you to plant a cover crop. Well, if you don't understand why you're planting a cover crop, when to plant, when to terminate, what to plant, what your resource concerns are, uh, and all of those types of things, you might be doing yourself more harm than good. So do you think it would be safe to say that maybe when the mindset shifts to committing to making something work, that that person is then probably more apt to look into the education and the reasons and and look at it from the standpoint that you're talking about rather than just, like you say, planting a cover crop or whatever that practice might be. That is correct. How, how many decades have we had incentive payments to no-till and plant cover crops? <laughs> Been around a long time, guys. Been around a long time, okay? And we haven't really made substantial progress in that regard. Uh, so, you know, to a very high degree, the reason being is because it's being viewed as a practice. I'm being paid to do this practice without a much deeper level of understanding about the why. Why are you doing this? And how does it really fit with your production system? And how do you make it really work? Um, so yes, you, you before you implement the practice, you've got to get the education. That's why we, we formed the Soil Health Academy for that specific purpose. So how are you reaching farmers and ranchers through that program? And how are you, I guess, approaching the conversations with them to get them to better understand, shift their mindset, you know, implement these changes and consider, you know, making them more than just practices, but actually like seeing the benefits of them? Yeah, multiplicity of ways. Um, you know, one is we have a very large number that come to us. So they find us that that's probably 70 plus percent. And it's a lot of people. As I said, we're working across 32 million acres in the U.S. alone, and we're working in 40 plus different countries now. Alan, talk about us. Who is us? And and explain your your uh, consulting business a little bit. Yep. So the us is uh, myself and my colleagues at Understanding Ag, uh, and that's a consulting company that we formed. Uh, my principal partners are uh, myself, Gabe Brown. Shane New, uh, David Kleinsmith, and uh, Kathy Richburg, but we also have a number of field consultants. So we have active field consultants in every region of the U.S., uh, in Canada, in Mexico, and the U.K., and we formed a nonprofit called the Soil Health Academy that is our educational arm. So after all those years in uh, academia and then leaving here, you find yourself back back at the root of education <laughs> and teaching farmers and helping them understand. Yeah, I've come full circle, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we do a ton of education and I love it. I love it. Even when I was at the university, I loved teaching. You know, it was the other things <laughs> that were the pain in the rear. You know, I loved it and and I still love the teaching part. I love seeing people have those aha moments and have success. Would you say that you enjoy educating on, on your own terms with your own uh, business over, you know, educating under maybe under the thumb, so to speak of a, of a university, it gives you a little more freedom this way. Well, a ton more freedom. Uh, it, you, there, there is no doubt about that. I mean, you, you are heavily constrained within the university setting in a multiplicity of ways. 
you know, even in regards to what you can or can't say. I mean, we were repeatedly admonished, you know, when I was at the university about what we can and can't say. I, I no longer have those any of those constraints. I can do whatever research I want to do as long as I have the funding to do it. I can say whatever I want to say, you know, and, and, and talk about whatever results I want to talk about. And I don't have endless university committee meetings <laughs> that I have to go to either. So, uh, so just getting things done is far more efficient. We can make a decision and do it then and there. So you've been able to cut committee meetings from your life. Now you just have to deal with annoying podcast hosts. You know, every, <laughs> everything has a downside, right? <laughs> I was going to say, now he has to deal with farmers all the time. I don't know what's you, worse. You know, that's, uh, that is such a joy. I mean, um, and I, we just pulled up on a ranch here in Idaho where we're going to be consulting today. And I, I have to tell you, I never have a bad day consulting. No matter how challenging the farmer or rancher may be, I never have a bad day consulting because you're always making progress. You're always moving things forward. And how can you not like that? You know, I'm not stuck in a city all day long in some conference room, right? I'm out on the land every day. And what is there not to like about that, guys? I think that's what so many farmers love about their jobs, at least myself. I know I can relate to exactly what you just said. I, I, I do not want to be stuck in an office all the time. In fact, when the weather's really nice, like it is right now, we don't get many days like that in Minnesota. And I struggle just enough to even sit in front of a computer and do this. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's the best life I've, I could ever ask for. Alan, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insight, your knowledge. Um, we, this is going to be a ton of value to our listeners. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Y'all take care. You too. Thanks, Alan. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay, bye. Well, Zach, that was um, quite the journey that Alan has been on to come, you know, full circle back to the farm while still educating farmers on regenerative ag practices. It is, you know, he said a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, one of the things that sticks with me is how much he talked about the principles of what they talk about and how the principles are the same no matter where they're going, no matter who they're talking to, no matter what they're doing, they just need to apply it within context. And I think I think even myself, I, I have to really look at it that way when we're looking at implementing new stuff on the farm and understand that the principles may be the same, we just might have to go about it a little bit different way. And I, and I just think that's so important to remember. Yeah. And the mindset, uh, aspect that you mentioned, not to get like too like woo woo, but you know, I think that our brains are really powerful things. And when we go into something with a lot of doubt and a lot of reservation about it, it like manifests itself in whatever we're trying. Whereas going like really going all in on something and just like trusting it, understanding it, researching it. Um, I think it really does influence the outcomes of, whatever practice we're implementing. I believe the same exact thing. I mean, I just, I think there's, like you say, not to get too woo-woo, <laughs> but I, I would agree. Mindset is huge in anything that anybody does. So that's going to do it for field work today. Um, our show is produced by Todd Melby with a lot of great help from Anna Canny. Kristen Schmidt runs our social media and Lauren Humbert is our project coordinator. Thanks to all the technical directors at American Public Media who help us record and mix this show. Be sure to check us out on social media. We're at Fieldwork Talk on all the usual channels, and we'd love it if you wrote us a review to help others find us too. Yeah, don't forget that we like hearing from you. You can give us a call with your comments or your questions, or if you just want to harass Tara and Mitchell and I, <laughs> then that number is 651-228-4810. Again, 651-228-4810.